Welcome everyone. We're going to let you uh, begin to make your way into our session today. So we'll get started in just a couple of moments uh, just to give everyone the opportunity to join in with us. I'm really excited about today's conversation. Uh, I'm with Professor Ji Seon Song, who's my colleague at the University of California, Irvine. And we're gonna have a great conversation for you today. So today, this is the third in our three-part series on contemporary issues in health, law, and bioethics. And we're going to be talking about criminalizing in the emergency room. It's an area that probably those of you who are medical professionals have actually probably had to think about uh, in an era where criminal law becomes such a vibrant part of our society and how we manage issues. Um, while you're coming in, I'm going to turn to a little bit of housekeeping. So as you have questions today, please submit them in the Q&A feature. You'll find that in the meetings control at the bottom of your screen. And I'll try to get to as many of your questions as I, as I can. And if there are questions that you would like for Professor Song to consider later, we're happy to share those with her if we don't get them, uh, get to them during today's presentation. And then also, if you have any technical uh, considerations or concerns, then please use the chat feature to do that. Now, as we've seen throughout this uh, series, you all put a lot of love in the chat, so I'm not going to deny you that. If you want to say wonderful things about Professor Song and this series, please feel free to use the chat. That's all right. And finally, if you're interested in upcoming events, news, or education programs, then please do subscribe to the Center for Bioethics at the email that you find on the screen, which is bioethics.hms.harvard.edu forward slash subscribe. And with that, I'll take the opportunity to introduce myself and to say a little bit more about uh, Professor Song. So I'm Michelle Bratcher Goodwin. I'm a chancellor's professor at the University of California, Irvine, uh, with my main faculty home being in law, uh, but also being in several other departments on our campus, including our public health department, School of Medicine, Stem Cell Research Center, and uh, our departments that address gender and sexuality studies and also criminal law and society. Um, at Harvard, I'm a senior lecturer at the Harvard Medical School and in our Center for Medical Ethics. And I'm so pleased to bring these programs to our community. And I couldn't be more thrilled than to have with me Professor Jishan Song. And she teaches and researches and focuses on criminal law, criminal procedure, and policing. And her scholarship examines the deployment of policing authority and corresponding effects on people of color and marginalized groups. Her research informs interventions that address race and class-based disparities in policing practices. And what I find so um, important and interesting about the work that she's doing at the intersections of medicine and policing, what does it mean when police come into the emergency room making demands of, uh, of hospital personnel. Uh, what are the ethics that surround that? What are the legal constraints that surround that? Um, what are the obligations? All of those issues we will get into discussion uh, today. And if you want to reach her apart from this, I'm just gonna ask her if she wouldn't mind putting her social media handles in the chat. Um, so that you can follow her and her brilliant work, and it really is important work. And uh, what she's going to be talking about today actually builds from an article that she's had published in the Harvard Law Review. It's called Policing the Emergency Room. It was published in 2021 in the Harvard uh, Law Review. And uh, coming up next, or this one has actually been published too, an ethical, legal, and structural framework for law enforcement in the emergency department. All right, we've got lots to talk about today. So if you don't mind, uh, Professor Song, if I can just use 
Ji Sung as we talk today. Yeah. All right, so I want to get us started. What motivated you to write in this area? So I um, was a public defender before I transitioned to academia. Okay, well, like, stop, stop. I'm glad, you know, I will be much kinder than the Senate. I'm glad that you were a public defender. I am I am not so pleased with what we have seen before a United States sen Senate with Judge Jackson, who was a public defender, but I digress. Please go on. No, and that there has been a lot about the confirmation hearing um, the, the that has uh, resonated with me um, and in part because of our shared experiences. But yes, it's, I think um, I was a juvenile public defender, which I think uh, some of my, some of my mentors, when they've kind of tried to excavate the reasons why I gravitated to something when I'm not a medical specialist or trained at all. And there's one particular story that I actually dedicated my, um, my law review article to one particular client. He was um, shot in the head by a police officer and he was 15 years old. Um, he, he was a foster child as well. So he was in the dependency side, so he didn't, and he had run away from a group home, so he didn't have any formal guardian. So I got the call from my um, supervisor and she was like, he's at this hospital, perhaps you should go try to figure something out. Now, I will have to say that I'm probably, the reason why I had to leave public defense is I didn't really quite have the boundaries probably necessary to have like a, like a, uh, to maintain my own uh, uh, mental health, but I rushed to the hospital. It was Highland Hospital in Oakland. Um, I was not able to see him. They would not let me see him. They told me it's because the police would not let me see him. I knew that he had no pending charges, that he had no violations that would prevent me. And especially because I was an attorney, I said, there's nothing you can do to prevent me from seeing him. But lo and behold, I wasn't able to go. So it wasn't until I sent very strongly worded emails to the general counsel, the counsel over at um, Highland that I was let in. And um, he was shot in the head. He lost one eye. He was um, pretty much blinded in the second. He was 15 years old and he was complaining of pain. He was in an enormous amount of pain. And what was so striking to me is that in just so many conversations I was having with the, his care team who, who were fantastic, but it was so clear to me that the narrative that he had deserved the shooting from the police had come in. And so I spent, ended up spending three weeks at that hospital by my patient, at my client's bedside. And through that, I began to uncover this tangle of legal, regulatory, moral, ethical problems at this intersection of policing and medicine that I had yet, not, not yet seen before. And, um, and that just, I could not let it go. And so it has now then turned into this multi-year research project. Well, I wanna build on this because I, I wanna take this opportunity and conversation with you to um, tease at something that some members of our audience might have. In fact, many people in this country may very well have, given that we've just uh, been um, partnered to, witnessed um, several days of a confirmation hearing for someone who may come on to the Supreme Court, uh, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, who worked as a federal defender serving indigent clients who would end up in the federal system. And if one were to come away from those hearings, you might think, why would anybody do that, mm -hmm. serve in that capacity? Uh, these are people who are just simply criminals. Why should we care about them? Um, in fact, we heard one senator say that an 18-year-old who did possess something that was heinous and graphic, but that that 18-year-old should get 50 years in prison. Can you help to explain a bit before we go deeper into the emergency room, just help to level set. Why do people become uh, public defenders? Why does criminal defense matter? And why does criminal defense matter for indigent people? And why is this, why was it so important that the framers of the constitution, especially for people who think about originalism and textualism, well, why was it that the original framers of the constitution thought it was so important to include in the constitution the kinds of protections that were central to your work? Yes, and I think um, that has also struck me that here is a constitutional right that is guaranteed 
your right to counsel is enshrined in the Constitution, yet Judge Jackson, uh, Katanji Jackson has had to undergo a battering because of her upholding that constitutional right that is so central to our liberties. And I think, you know, I'm not um, a, histor a legal historian, but I do think that there is, there is um, the, at, the, at, the, at this country's founding, a sense that there was the power of the crown and then the people and how um, so much of going into court and um, happened without having the aid of someone next to you who understood the language of the law, who could help you in this um, very complicated set of legal rules that um, you know, govern our conduct and to be able to speak and defend. Right. And I think that, um, you know, Gideon versus Rainwright wasn't decided until the 1960s. But then at that point, I think there, um, especially when you saw at the same time in the 1960s, a broadening of law enforcement. And what is Gideon and v. Budgets. Rainwright for our medical audience that may not uh, be So Gideon versus that. Rainwright was it, it, it says that the constitutional right to counsel is something that you're guaranteed. So if you're indigent, even if you're poor, you have a right to have counsel that you don't and have. This to is pay our for. United state Supreme Court. So we have both the Constitution, which was not written by a bunch of women of color. Yes. <laughs> but we might, yeah, I mean, we would have had that in there, I think, a lot of women of color. But this was a Constitution that was written by framers who were um, propertied wealthy people that wrote the Constitution that guaranteed the right of counsel because it was understood as important. And this was not seen as a right to counsel for your civil disputes, which that too does matter. And I think that that's an important distinction, right? This right to counsel, not just when you're suing over something which is different, but then actually having a right to counsel when the state says you did something. And then take you, away your liberty, right? That you, that you could be put in prison, that you could be put to death right, for um, what the state is alleging that you did. And um, I think that amongst public, I mean, people come at public defender work for a variety of reasons, right, but many do because they strongly believe in this the, the mission that it's only by protecting those who are charged criminally can we make sure that all our constitutional rights are protected, right? So like, and there, I think part of what emanates from my research about the Fourth Amendment in the hospital space and EDs is that what happens if people who are so vulnerable, if we're acutely vulnerable in our bodies, and the court is not recognizing our Fourth Amendment rights there against police. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that has been, that is one of the most motivating questions for me is when you have acute vulnerability, the power of the state, and then how is it that the court fails to see mm -hmm. suffering, right? And then one more piece with that, which actually comes to mind in the wake of, you know, your article published in the Harvard Law Review, and congratulations again, it's a big Thank deal you. to be published in the Harvard Law Review, it really, really is. And with your work, it's published at a time in which the sort of we've seen um, a Me Too movement, sort of recognizing the ways in which uh, women's voices are often overlooked when women are complaining about sexual assault, um, rape, and that raises all sorts of issues about um, policing in the emergency room and also just sort of criminal law response in the emergency room, rape kits and all of that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what, I and mean, maybe you'll be writing next articles on those <laughs> issues, all right? So, so that, that gets implicated. And then racial justice is implicated given the um, tragic death of Ahmad Aubrey being tracked down and killed in cold blood, Breonna Taylor in the middle of the night, shot multiple times, falsified relief police reports, and then the whole world over saw George Floyd tragically murdered, many people say lynched, under the knee of an officer, also police reports falsified. The only reason why I mention that before we lead up to this wonderful piece of yours is, is again to level set. And I, I think about, it, it makes me think about the deaths of Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner years ago, who had gone south to help people register to vote. Mm -hmm. And the end result, sadly, was a burnt out car, multiple bullet wounds, and the demands of 
their spouses and mothers of um, Goodman and Schwerner saying, you must find our sons. Our sons were down there. They were down there to uphold civil liberties of other people, which was important for voting and whatnot. And we have not heard from them. And police were implicated in that. Right. And so when we are just simply honest, a bit more honest about the kind of entanglements of where we are, right, it's it's not all just black and white. There's a whole many levels of beige and gray in between, Absolutely. which gets us back to why it was so important when the framers recognize that sometimes the state will make mistakes and sometimes the state will act intentionally in wrongful ways. Yes. And um you know, I just came out of teaching my one first year criminal law class where it's always exciting when the students suddenly start seeing where all the gray is. And it is in that, and it's interesting that you talk about the gray because I want to, I just gave a grand rounds this morning to a bunch of uh, physicians and saying, well, what is happening in the emergency room is that there is just gray and law enforcement has occupied that gray. And I think, um, and if you think about the right to counsel, right, as being a way to um, really highlight the gray and force courts to reckon with when power is being abused, when a person is being subject and criminally prosecuted wrongfully, or even not, right, but that their rights have not been protected. Um, yes, that goes to like these fundamental values that, um, you know, I was just so struck by Cory Booker's um, defending of Judge Katanji Jackson yesterday, just thinking like, it's just fundamentally, if we believe, and I do believe that America is about hope and America is about progress, then in essence, the work of a public defender is always hopeful, right? It's always hoping that we will, even in the face of what we think of as despicable behavior or just um, really awful human conduct that we could still at that moment see how we can all benefit more by making sure that those who are vulnerable and weak are not, not um, exploited by the state. Right. Well, with that foundation, and, and I thank our audience very much for sticking with us. I know that they've come to hear you talk about being in the emergency room, but I also think, and I saw a little bit of love and some hearts coming into the chat, that they're appreciating that uh, we could do a little bit of level setting here. Yeah. So tell us about this work. I want to just turn the stage over to you to tell us about your article and this research, which really comes significantly out of your experience as a public defender. Yes, yeah, so I um, I just want to give this just a broad, just some overview of how I've been thinking about this. So at this juncture of policing and hospitals, and I've especially um, looked at emergency care, um, you see an area where constitutional laws don't protect individuals as much, health privacy laws don't protect individuals as much, and where the discretion of this profession that we just talked about, law enforcement, is accorded great deference. And then there's this just discretion of other professionals, the medical practitioner is stymied by that law enforcement. So in my research, I've, unco I've um, uncovered that courts generally view emergency departments as an extension of the street so that policing encounters in the ED are just like policing encounters on the street with willing and dutiful medical providers to aid in police work and hence that individuals ultimately are subject to less protection. And I argue that this rendition by the courts ignores the reality that emergency department physicians, trauma surgeons, hospital staff know, which is that emergency departments are actually a place where policing regularly occurs, where police are routinely present among medically vulnerable patients, and that this space that is for patients has been turned into a space of policing, and where policing actions often come into contradiction with the healthcare mandate to provide care and the fundamental ethic of do no harm. And I especially, I, the reason why I focus on the ED is for three primary reasons. So one, it's a widely used healthcare setting in our healthcare system. It's also widely used by a particular subset of our population, low-income and minority communities that also overlaps with the groups that are subject to the most police and most vulnerable. And, and then- you know, I, And just one moment on yeah. that too. I, 
I'm glad that you mentioned that, right? The, the communities that are more likely to be policed, which doesn't mean that they're more likely to commit crimes, right? They're just simply more likely to be policed, which is a very interesting and important point because I think sometimes people interpret the data as to what prison populations look like as in how many tickets are given out and what are the demographics that they interpret that as well it's because those people are committing most of the mm -hmm. crimes and mm -hmm. what we know for people who study in this area and like you know as your research like no that's not it it's just that some groups get policed more some groups get ticketed more other people get passes police police more outside of the gates of Yale than inside the gates of Yale and if you're looking at the same populations by age if you policed inside the gates, you'd get the same number of hits for underage drinking, for use of drugs, for distribution of drugs, as you'd get outside of the gates. But we don't police inside the gates. We police outside of the gates, which gives this false narrative yes. that it's black and brown kids who are engaging in this behavior and others are not. Right, and exactly, it's this idea for a long time where people, criminal scholars have called it like, and jurists, a high crime area, right? Is it really a high crime area or is it just a highly policed area, right? Is this a high crime group or is this a highly policed group? And I think the emergency department is a place where you have those people who have to go there for a variety of reasons. And then you have police who also end up going there for a variety of reasons, right? So they go there when people are injured. Because, I mean, people go to EDs because they're injured, because perhaps because of crime. So then police accompany them, police get called in, maybe police are already there because there's a lot of hospitals that are, especially in minority communities where for whatever reason, police operate as security. So like, for example, in San Francisco and in Los Angeles, the sheriff's department um, ends up being serving as hospital security. And then emergency departments, my final reason why is because that's where jails and prisons take their incarcerated people when they need to. And so you have this phenomenon where external hospitals and EDs end up not being just the safety net for all of us, but also the safety net for the carceral system because the carceral system is unable to provide adequate health care. And um, so my research has uncovered a number of things. One is on the criminal procedure side that the court discounts medical vulnerability, they do not see it when it comes to criminal constitutional right questions. They ex expect and affirm medical professionals per to participate. They get them kind of like a good citizenship gloss, which totally ignores medical ethics or duties that medical providers owe to patients. And then I also, in my other research, uncovered that there's just a whole bunch of laws and obligations that medical providers are told that they can, should, or must do in the face of law enforcement request. But there's no corresponding countervailing authority that medical providers can rely upon to push back against that. And so this imbalance makes it untenable for medical providers to do their job and leads to situations where they perhaps inadvertently become party to abuses of police authority or broadening police authority without their even meaning to. And then when we come back to this idea, this what we know about racialized policing, right? We know about racialized policing and also racial racial and um, biases in the healthcare system. This um, to then provide this kind of like almost uh, free space for policing in a healthcare setting used by vulnerable populations and minority communities has ramifications not just for the criminal legal system, but for a healthcare system that has its own problematic past and then issues of mistrust, which we know, and especially now in COVID, I don't know, pandemic or endemic, wherever we are now, have seen have real consequences. Um, and so just to give you some examples of where the tensions might arise between medical providers and law enforcement. So yes, please give us examples. Yes. These are so very request, helpful. Folks, take your notes. <laughs> request for patient, for patient information. I was just doing a grand rounds today at a hospital and they were like, well, what happens when an officer asks me um, what the medical condition of a patient is so I can clear an evidence scene and a crime scene? I'm like, what does an ED doctor, why would you have any place in 
telling a police officer to clear the crime scene. That was a new one to me, but it's, there's all sorts of kind of justifications I think law enforcement give and why they need that information, they need that information now that implicates patient pri privacy and confidentiality, requests for diagnostic procedures, right? So like cavity searches, CT scans, I mean, uh, more invasive procedures under anesthesia, usually to um, discover drugs inside of a body, clearly implicates patient autonomy, patient care, and then- And, and also patients' rights, right? Patients', patients rights. constitutional rights, right? right? So what's also very interesting is that physicians and also other medical personnel may not be aware of like, what is the law in this area? I mean, the police are here, they've got their guns, I'm feeling kind of intimidated, and they're telling me I have to do this, and they may not know there are lots of rights being implicated, including that individual's rights, that that individual has a right to bodily autonomy mm -hmm. based on the United States Constitution. An officer can't just say, okay, now I want a cavity search, and doctor, I now demand that you do it. That's not supposed to happen that way, but oftentimes medical personnel may not know that. And feel pressured to, or then be served with a warrant and think <clears throat> that they have to comply with the warrant when really, if you don't think it's medically indicated, the courts have recognized that you don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. And then there's requests for this thing, this new thing that's kind of medical clearance. So um, oftentimes they'll come to the ED because a person has to be medically cleared before they go to the jail. But that implicates a whole slew of things, especially when you're, um, one, it's primarily about law enforcement liability. There's nothing in the law that says that ED hospitals are supposed to, and hospitals are supposed to medically clear a person. Um, and also when you think about it, when there is so much that we now know about jail and prison conditions, how violent they are, how um, they can exacerbate conditions. And especially when you think about this at the height of the COVID pandemic, right? When outbreaks were happening at the jail because jails and prisons, because they weren't following other mandated protocols that the rest of the country was supposed to follow, that this idea of medical clearance then I think becomes very problematic. Then there's just the use of the physical markers, right? So handcuffs, shackles, other, restraints that implicate dignity and patient care, and then arguably constitutional um, rights against cruel and unusual punishment, the presence of guards that prohibit a provider from having a private conversation, which, you know, not just infringes on patients' rights, but also prevents, may end up preventing adequate or accurate care. And then there's a related but also complicated thing where um, let's say a police use of force person comes in with the police. And um, one, even though medical providers have mandatory reporting obligations for all sorts of things, right? Like um, uh, for other kinds of crimes, there is no mandatory reporting when a physician suspects that a police has used force, even though you can imagine police use of force is highly likely to result in a visit to the ED. And so ultimately right now, I'm just really um, grappling with all the reasons why this is. And I think that this is a problem of not just criminal procedure and the imbalance of laws, like a legislative problem, but there's also a problem of like two different systems that are just not really used to being in conversation with one another um, and also often just are siloed. Like it was remarkable how when I first embarked on this project, a bunch of lawyers, including, you know, people in the criminal side were like, what are you talking about? This is an issue or it's only an issue in this one discrete area. And then I would go to like, you know, even a dinner party and there's just a bunch of doctors there and every single one of them has like 20 stories to tell me about how this impacts patient care. There's also a problem with mismatch and problem with regulation. So if you think about hospitals and medical providers as being a highly regulated subset of our society, and then you have law enforcement who are really under-regulated in lots of ways. And so it's also this interesting phenomenon where this like under-regulated supersedes that of a more highly regulated entity. And then I think we, I come down to that. This is also just a problem of custom people have been used to it. So you see medical, I've talked to medical providers who are like, wait, this, there's no, I have no problem with police. Like they're my friends or we have a good working relationship. And then it's only when I start 
prodding a little bit and give some examples that I see an aha moment where sometimes it's accompanied by deeply troubled looks where they suddenly realize that, yeah, maybe I have treated this patient who's under law enforcement custody differently than I would have otherwise. And then you also see this in like right now for medical providers who are trying to push back and maybe those of you who are who have experienced this before, where it's so stressful to push back. Michelle, you talked about the gun and badge. I mean, this is not a small consequence. There have been reports of um, doctors who have been, and nurses who have been arrested. Now I gave, gave one example the other day about a nurse who got arrested in Salt Lake City. She ended up with a multi-million dollar settlement because of it. Um, but you know, other things like, I need your employment number, you're gonna be investigated, you're on my radar. There is something terrifying about suddenly being That's right. at that crosshairs. And, you know, I think if we're honest about it, there are <clears throat> officers who really care about serving the community. They really uh -huh. do. And I think there's something to be said. There's a whole discourse about how women police differently than men do. Um, and that most of the unlawful type of policing happens to occur with men and that there's still barriers to entry for women. And, and in the debate about police abolition, there are some that say, well, they don't care, you know, yeah. male, female, et, et cetera. But there are differences. There are studies that show the sort of differences in the use of force, um, women's ability to be able to de-escalate, um, serving as good listeners in these spaces. Um, and there's a documentary um, that came out in 2020, Women in Blue, which actually studied the Minneapolis mm. Police Department, leading right up to the death of George Floyd when it had previously uh, a woman chief of police. And so, you know, I, I, I preface that to say that, yes, there are those who really care to do a good job. And yet all the, at the same time, we also know that there is a history of policing that dates back to slavery, which yeah. was the original policing in, in this country, right? And, and we have to be able to hold complex thoughts <laughs> at the same time, right? The ability to see that, yes, we want our communities to be protected. And yet at the same time, understand these histories and realities that were associated with policing. I mean, let's be clear, when we look at the images of the civil rights movement of people who are just trying to get their civil liberties acknowledged, the people who were most harmful to them were actually people in law enforcement. Now, none of us like that history, but that is the reality, and that's what's captured in black and white footage, right? When we think about what led to the 1964 uh, Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act, it's a bloody Sunday, a bloody Sunday that's not necessarily civilian. Civilians often joined in, but we're talking about law enforcement doing that work of you will not have these rights. You will not get to the place to vote. You will not, and we will be on our horses and we will use our batons and we will use our bats and we'll use whatever it is that's necessary to keep you from being able to exercise your constitutional rights. And it seems to me that in a time now where things are just um, so polarized that it's really mm -hmm. difficult to just hold the truth of facts together while we think about pathways forward. Yeah, and I, I, I really hear that. And I think that, um, you know, that's also something that has come up a lot in my research about, you know, there are, there are reasons why law enforcement have legitimate reasons to go to places. There are law enforcement who recognize and when they work with in the ED who exercise their allowable discretion to reinforce patient care to work with the medical provider. But I think it's also really important to think about, as you said, the history. I've actually been doing some digging into slave hospitals um, in the South and thinking and it's interesting how a lot of the kind of dual loyalty problems that I'm seeing right now in the healthcare spaces mimic so much of this kind of dual loyalty problem that medical providers had at the time of slavery when, for example, it was like one writer I think describes as a triangulated relationship where you'd have the slave and then you have the slave owner as being um, part of the relationship with the doctor, you know? And I think things like that just always give me such a stark reminder of 
what, where we, where we're coming from, right? Or like what we have to reckon with deeply historically in our institutions and how it's not, it's not about saying at this moment that you are the same, right? But it's saying that our institutions are built from such foundations. And, and, and frankly, I think that part of the reason I keep engaging in this work is because it's also very motivating and inspiring. I've been, I've now talked to so many doctors across the country who are like, engaging and phenomenal organizing work with communities right and so where they're giving grand rounds where they're educating their fellow physicians on the structural discrimination that occurred in their neighborhood or with their mm -hmm. hospital for mm -hmm. them to understand the kind of community care that they should give patients and the medical and, students too yep you know I, I exactly to to I uh, think about this conversation also and include aspects of sex and gender too. Mm -hmm. I don't know if your research is is taking you in that domain, but you know, in my work, as I've covered the intersections of policing and also sex and race and, and so forth, we've seen a number of areas, women being threatened with police being called if they refuse a C-section. Yeah. Um, there have been cases of uh, women being subjected to the police call because they fell down steps and then came to the ER room. Um, there have the, the cases that I've yet to write about, but that I've collected, which really just are horrific, um, are the cases of vaginal searches on the side of the road. I don't know if you, you know, like the, I mean, there's just really in these yeah. spaces of policing or the shackling of women who are incarcerated. I think few people understand that the face of incarceration often looks male. And so we don't pay attention to the fact that policing also happens with women and that in the United States, um, it is the country that has the largest number of incarcerated women in the world. Um, the US incarcerates more women than Russia, China, India, Thailand combined, and you can talk in Mexico too. And I think people really fail to, to, to see that and understand that. And then what happens when women are incarcerated? They don't stop, you know, the biology doesn't stop, right? So the incidences of breast cancer and ovarian cancer and pregnancy, sometimes through rape from a guard and, and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, and then the questions of medical neglect, what doctors are able to do or what they're not, or in the state of California, uh, just recently, all of the work about coercive sterilization um, in our jails and prisons here in California, right? So, the, the, you know, this has many different layers, this intersection between criminal justice and then also the medical space. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I do I do spend time on the, the exactly the California program, which is not that long ago, fairly no. recent. No, right, like this is not, yeah. we're, we're not no, talking like about 10 years, 15 years is, ago, we're talking it, about just exactly. a few years ago. And then, and, and, and shackling of pregnant women, like, why do you, I mean, actually, so, so there's another story that brought me, I didn't talk, but I had a young woman who was um, pregnant and then gave birth, but she was incarcerated. And um, then ends up going, when she gives birth, she goes to the hospital and they have like her ankle bracelet on the whole time. Like, you know, people, and then that night, she has the baby, she gets up, she makes a call, a call to the nurse to ask the nurse for help to put on the diaper on the baby because she's afraid to touch the umbilical cord. Mm -hmm. The nurse sees her, I'm assuming, uh, this is, I mean, wait, so the you nurse sees her, she's in, out, the, in, the, in the cell or? or no, or? this is like out in an external, but sees okay. the ankle because this, this is the only way she was able to go out, right? So a lot of people go out to have their, their child and then calls CPS on her immediately because sees mm -hmm. a, a young black brown black girl and then with an ankle bracelet and then that she clearly cannot because she asked me how to put the diaper on i'm like what kind of first time mother would not have that same question and that also so but there's that but then there's also the extreme use of like shackling during pregnancies now there's been a bunch of laws to say oh this is outlawed except for and this is mimics everything else right in these laws that you might have laws that seem more protective but they have a big public safety caveat 
Mm-hmm. Except right. when. So the, <clears throat> so the narrative is this this protects public safety by having her shackled while she's giving birth. Well, no, you can take it off except if there's some public safety concern. And so you can see how the exception swallows the rule. Oh, right. Well, because then it would be like my public, you know, the safety concern was that she was what she was going to overtake the guard, overtake the, the exactly. doctors and the nurse. And so I mean, but imagine then, you know, the, the sort of indignity of that, right? The indignity of being shackled during pregnancy and delivery. Um, and then the indignity of being born while your, you know, um, parent is shackled. Yes. You know, I mean, it just unpacking that we need to. So um, one last bit, and, and I'm going to share screen. I hope this works. Ashley, if it doesn't work, then I'll be needing your technical help. But I want to share screen uh, to show a short video clip. Uh, this was a, a couple of years before George Floyd passed away, before mm. he died, before he's killed, murdered, lynched. Um, and it involves the case of Barbara Dawson, and I think that it helps to put this conversation in context. So I'm going to share screen and hope that everything ends up working. Okay. Men who died after being forcibly removed from Can the you hear sound? is calling for a federal investigation. 57-year-old Barbara Dawson was admitted for stomach pain, and she later complained of shortness of breath. Well, she died less than two hours after a police officer arrived to remove her from the hospital. Elaine Cajano of our digital network CBSN is here with the encounter captured in a police dash cam audio recording. Elaine, good morning. Good morning. Barbara Dawson was discharged by hospital staff in the early morning hours of December 21st. When she refused to leave her room, they called police who placed her under arrest for disorderly conduct and trespassing. Oh my god. Or I can take you out of here. Oh. Barbara Dawson said she was in pain and couldn't breathe. But Officer John Tadlock with the Blountstown Police Department tried to remove her oxygen mask. Let's take this off. You, you can't take that off. I can. No, you can't. Yes, ma'am. You can not wear You have to leave. Dawson arrived by ambulance to Calhoun Liberty Hospital around eight hours earlier. Angela Donar was with her niece throughout the ordeal. And I said, well, she need her option. No, she don't. She fine. She fine. No, leave me alone. Leave me alone. I can't even breathe. Officer Tadlock suspected Dawson was trying to avoid going to jail. Please I can't breathe. You seem to be okay right now. No, I can't. Please. Please put your hand behind you. I beg you. Dawson collapsed outside of the hospital, just feet from the police car. Falling down like this and laying down, that's not going to stop you from going to jail. She is sick. She's okay. Dawson remained next to the police car for 18 minutes. Officer Tadlock and medical staff tried to get her in. She's just dead weight. Maybe lay her back and then somebody grab her feet. Minutes later, a doctor demanded Dawson be readmitted to the hospital where she died. Calhoun Liberty Hospital said they continue to grieve the loss of a patient, and we are setting up a medical and community task force to review best practices and better communication. In that tape, she was begging for help. Martha Smith Dixon said her cousin was a pillar of her community. Everyone knew Barbara. She was a jewel. Benjamin Crump is representing Dawson's family. Nobody should die like this. Today it was Barbara Dawson. If we don't speak to this, it will be someone else tomorrow. Barbara Dawson was uninsured. A medical examiner found she died from a blood clot in her lung. Hospital staff told police Dawson was okay and had been discharged. Two Florida agencies are investigating. Gail? Very disturbing story. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, let me... Much, Elaine. Okay. This... It's a tragic story, right? Um, it's um, it, it's something that no one should have to encounter or endure. And it strikes me, you know, she had a blood clot, sought emergency care. She had no prior criminal. It, it, it's just striking that someone who seeks medical attention and care um, ends up having the police called on them. So one version of what you're writing about are police bringing people into the ER. And the other version of it is from within the medical space, the police being called on people where it shouldn't be the logical conclusion of a person who's saying that she can't breathe. 
that the next thing should be law enforcement getting involved. I mean, how, how does one address that? And then for those of you who have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll begin answering some of your questions. I mean, this is part of the problems that EMTALA, and I'm sorry, it's an acronym, but it, it, it the emergency medical treatment, um, which required emergency departments that get some kind of federal funding in order to screen a problem of um, one, I think, this that being an unfunded mandate. So like a lot of hospitals doing the bare, so hospitals doing the bare minimum when it comes to someone who's uninsured. And so they're not doing a full medical workup because they, and also combined with perhaps assumptions and perhaps based upon her race and her class and her gender about mm -hmm. whether to take her um, seriously. I mean, I just saw pictures of her, but I was also in, in another space that I'm in just talking about like all the assumptions that doctors bring to patients who they think are obese and how they don't take seriously their medical considerations because they blame it on them just being fat or their mm -hmm. diet and think that, oh, well, and so how that intersects with the care. And then two, I think this also shows the, um, the close relationship that EDs and hospitals have to police that you can feel free to call a police officer to say they're trespassing on my property because uh, they've been discharged and they won't leave. This happens a lot, especially to homeless patients who, who or people who are mentally ill who may come and then who don't leave right away. There have been reports about them. I mean, there was a, even a lawsuit emanating um, in Oregon about this that's ongoing. And then this, what I was talking about, the medical clearance. So then she was obviously given some kind of sign off that she's okay to be taken to jail. And clearly she wasn't. And I, such a tragic well, and story. The interesting thing is she, she wasn't like coming from jail. She was like coming from home yeah. in, a, in an ambulance saying she couldn't breathe. And there's this, I, there's this. Right, discharge and because she won't leave here, let's call the police. And she has a blood clot in her lungs. And this also, I mean, I, so one of the trainings I was giving was, uh, uh, uh these doctors who work actually in a jail, right? So they're employed by a different entity, private entity, but they work inside a jail or a nonprofit. And the training that they were explaining, the training that they received. So it's like they're in a dark room, they have to watch a video and the messaging is they lie. And when I say they, right, the incarcerated, the prisoners, the criminals, they lie. They will do everything they can because they want to avoid jail and so they want to come to you and get healthcare. And so this narrative that really downplays what may already be in our implicit biases of practitioners for certain groups to like not take seriously their medical concerns is compounded. It's compounded and it's complicated. All right, we're gonna to get to some of these questions. Um, so um, first question from someone that I know, all right, Dr. Blevins, all right. If he understands it correctly, is it, uh, it is allowable for police to lie to suspects but are there limitations on them lying, making up rules and conditions to medical personnel or the general public who aren't suspects? Really great question. That's such a fascinating question. Isn't that a great question? Yeah. That's a law review article. Oh, yeah. Okay. So yes, yes, it is allowable for police to lie, though there are places that are trying to legislate around that, um, especially around youth interrogations. Um, so the only, uh, just from, the limitations that I see are only if medical personnel, perhaps if they rely on something that the police officer said, and then expose them to some liability, and then they're wanting to uh, blame or uh, rely on or go after the police for that lie, that they relied on that lie and then acted, I could see, but that is like a ex post kind of limit, right. which is not but the same thing as like- shouldn't a, just be lying to nurses and doctors, right? They're, that's just simply not something that is lawful. And, and I know, and I can't, I, so, and I wanna take, there's the lie, but there's also like, not really the lie, right? So um, like a couple examples that I give in the article are like people who um, police will say are just like witnesses or victims, especially like gunshot wounds. And they'll be like, they're victims or it was, we're just, we're just investigating. We wanna see how he got shot or something. And then those people can then get charged with felon in possession of a firearm and end up in federal court and then their DNA gets put in. And then, so there's all sorts of ways in which it's not even like a lie and a truth, right? But it's also the kind of like the, the gloss of, or kind of like 
Right. Um, and are you aware of any kind of handbook that helps physicians and medical personnel to sort through? All right, so that's another project. Okay, uh, can you speak to the limits of HIPAA yes. regarding these law enforcement requests? So first of all, HIPAA um, disclosure, HIPAA has a disclosure um, subsection, it's discretionary. So um, know that, that it's discretionary first. But there's, and there's, they actually have much more tighter provisions when a person is supposed to, is, is categorized as a victim, right? If they're categorized as a victim, there are certain steps and there's like maybe four, four to six steps that a provider has to go through before they release it um, or to justify why they didn't ask permission from the victim first. And also with the caveat that this information is not to be used against the patient. Now there's also another separate HIPAA ex a, a, a disclosure exception, which relates to state laws. And this is where a lot of stuff comes in because of state mandatory reporting obligations. And I went back and looked at like this 1927 JAMA editorial written by a doctor when the first mandatory reporting for a gunshot wound law got passed in New York. And he wrote this editorial, like, why us, why us? There's a bunch of other people before it gets to us who can report on this gunshot wound. This is going to impact my ability to provide care and for patients to want to come to me. And I think that I, in some ways, I think the mandatory reporting obligation seems like a, a lost battle or not anything live, but I think it's, especially for physicians, it becomes a big, a big hole that allows law enforcement requests and stuff to come in. All right, I'm going to go to another question. I think there was another part of Phil's question too, which also related to HIPAA and uh, law enforcement taking pictures of patients or overhearing healthcare conversations. Maybe you know, let's add to that because there are, you know, th there are limitations in terms of what is private and what uh, can be shielded from later disclosure and what isn't right such as if something is being heard by a third party in a public venue can you ex can you unpack that a yeah bit? so you i'll start by saying this so i was talking to a former hipaa privacy or someone who uh, worked worked in um the hipaa privacy government office and um a hipaa privacy officer and she when i described these things to her she's like hipaa is not designed for these like dynamic interactions that you know hipaa is designed for like oh a celebrity came into the hospital and uh, the hospital staff disclosed or there's a big pile of hospital records um that nobody shredded right and so um in that sense it's a little bit like a like a a mismatch there but just looking at HIPAA itself, patient health information of for overhearing like that is a HIPAA violation. So when I talk to hospital privacy um, officers or people who are in the privacy unit, I'm like, you you should care about police presence in the ED, not just because of how it affects that person who's under law enforcement custody, but because you're opening the door to every single other person's PHI who's here. Now the taking pictures part, I think that that, so oftentimes they might say, oh, this is for evidence collection. And that is um, one, I don't see why you wouldn't ask permission, right? If the person was taking pictures when you're outside the hospital, right? The police were taking pictures, let's say you were the victim of a burglary and they come in, I mean, Unfortunately, my, you know, my family has had to do that and they come and they ask, they ask, you want to press charges, they ask if you can take pictures, they ask you things, yet, because you're in the space that, you know, the courts kind of think is public and police officers think is public, when it's actually very private, like your body, somehow, they can't just ask. Well, this, is, this is very interesting because, again, when we think about the Constitution, we, you know, there are rules about, you know, even your house, right, let alone your body, right, yeah. very strong rules, yeah. right, that you can't even enter the kind of physical structure around someone, let alone their bodies. Um, I want to turn to uh, another question from our audience. Thank you so much. You have so populated our Q&A and the chat. Uh, which relates to, are there benefits? Um, can police officers offer something of benefit in terms of information um, that might help in treating a patient? 
Well, I think that is probably better answered by someone who's on the medical side who would be able to say, oh, there's certain kinds of information that I need in order to better treat this person. Um, I think, though, that if there is some kind of benefit, it's, um, you know, one hospital that I'm working with, it's, it's a matter of figuring out how to formalize that channel of communication, right? So that um, can't you have that communication without giving a carte blanche to police to the ED completely, right? There's a triage nurse that, that sits there at the trauma bay and most EDs I've been to. And so like give that information, put it in the hospital notes. Does that also mean that the police follows the patient into the trauma bay and then into the CT mm-hmm. scanning room? That I think is the question for me. Um, and, but that doesn't um, foreclose that they might give information. Now, I think the flip side of it, and this is what I was also hearing um, both in my research and recently, is that, well, what if it's a police use of force, right? And the person comes in, there is some incentive from the police to perhaps not give you as much information as the patient might need. And then that ends up affecting and impacting patient care too. Another question, um, and and I've seen this, and you may have too in, in your work, which is, um, with individuals who are undocumented, mm-hmm. who may be afraid to stay at a hospital or even go to a, a hospital because they're concerned about ICE policing um, hospitals. Has that come up for you? Yes. Your work? And okay. so, and I think um, part of it, so um, Alice Goffman wrote a book uh, 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 years ago, um, and one of the controversies of her book was that uh, police were running warrants and, you know, some people couldn't believe that police would run warrants or run names. But that was also in our research, a common thing that physicians noticed, right? That they didn't know why, but that they would see people taking names or- What does some, that mean? So run warrants. So when they take your name, they can run it through the system to see if you have a warrant, right? And exactly. the whole thing about Ferguson, um, uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, right, uh, is was the idea that that whole town had so many people who had just like very low level warrants, but that gives the police officer an excuse to arrest you, right? And they have these low level warrants, right? To also further explain, right? So they've Mm -hmm. got these low level warrants because they are being more policed in the community across the way, right? Like, so they're being policed just by standing on corners and literally crossing the street, but not in the crosswalk. Yeah. And they're getting a ticket. And this is happening one community over, which happens to be predominantly white and people do it and they don't pay attention to it and they don't. Right. And this is part of what the Department of Justice investigation found. Right. Like like two different cities, one that's more brown and one that's more white doing the same things. But it's over here in the brown community where people are being ticketed for jaywalking, ticketing on the court, like all of these petty tickets. But these tickets add up. If you can't afford to pay them, you're right. 15 years old, 16 years old, 18, 19, you know, you're, you're 50 and you can't afford to pay the jaywalking ticket and it's in the system long enough, then hence the warrant, but not because you were some dangerous person brandishing a weapon and trying to rob someplace. Right. And then, you know, turning to the undocumented side is that, you know, in California, there was a, um, and in certain other hospitals that are especially close to the border that ICE agents would come in and they would, um, you know, do uh, raids of such to pick up people who are undocumented. Um, California did pass a California Bios- Values Act to make places like hospitals, like sanctuary spaces when it comes to um, immigration. Um, but yes, that is, uh, and I think that undocumented leads also into other people who may have fears of being police or may not want to just be around them for whatever reason. And then also mm-hmm. not seeking care or walking away because of I that. actually open a Yale Law Journal piece that I wrote a few years ago with a case involving um, a woman, Mrs. Borrego, who uh, sought medical care and, uh, and, and, immigration enforcement was called on her um, as she was using a a falsified, I think, license it was. But this was her regular medical provider, but she went to a different office, you know, so the the medical provider had two offices. um, And she went for a treatment of her condition, but not to the main office and the people at the other office called um, ICE on her. So it is a it is a real concern. And she was arrested in front of her nine or 10 year old daughter. Uh, and um, and then subject to deportation and then 
you know, there were efforts to try to help her. She had been living in the United States for um, a while. Her children were documented. She was not. Mm -hmm. Um, Her husband was documented. She was not. And she actually had like, she had medical insurance through her husband's employment, but she was not documented. All right. Um, There is a question which may have been more rhetorical about why on earth did the hospital call the police on uh, Ms. Dawson? It's a good question, right? It's it's a question that we can all spend time with. And I think that the work that, you know, explains implicit and explicit biases say a lot. And I think also the explanation that you offer when, you know, hospitals say, okay, we've stabilized. We're required through Mtala to stabilize. We've stabilized and we don't want to do anything more. She's dying from a blood clot in her lung or, you know, um, but so long as we don't do the work to discover it, we've done enough to just say she's stable. All right. Um, having heard many of the ways in which the presence of law enforcement in medical spaces raises significant ethical concerns, can you speak to some of the ways in which the presence of law enforcement can be supportive and or consider the contours of a legitimate role for police in medical spaces, given what you found in your research? So, For example, in sexual assault instances, right? Like, and there are, um, I think in many EDs, there might be, I'll use the term SART, but sexual assault response team um, unit. Um, and in at least one ED, I saw that there was a room for it, right? So the law enforcement had a key for it. That was a safe space for sexual assault victims to go. And so, and there's obvious value for something like that. You need evidence collection. There's all sorts of forensic things that help make that woman be her victimization um, then be vindicated later. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the, that as long as it doesn't spill over, right, to other ways, when uh, the problem is that you could have legitimate and necessary roles for police in hospitals and emergency rooms and for victims of crime, for victims of injuries. There's all sorts of reasons why we we turn to the police that are legitimate, but it's this like diffuse kind of like um, bleeding over into other ways and these kinds of informal things that aren't documented and are virtually then unseen. Mm -hmm. And then if you think about people who are, don't know what's going on, right? Because they're like, sick or you know sedated or whatever patients Mm -hmm. that then things are happening to them that they can't control Mm -hmm. and then you have the eyes of the state literally Mm -hmm. the 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 arm of the state that can use force upon them and then within law there are you know part of the reasons why the protections that we've talked about are in the bill of rights um is because we understand um just how um, it affects our democracy and rule of law for the state to act in tyrannical ways, right? So in law, we're really concerned not just about it, by the action itself, but also the perception of the action yes. as well. Um, and we're deeply concerned about the constraining of people's um, civil liberties and civil rights by the potential threat, by the threat itself, even if not actualized in mm-hmm. certain spaces. Um, and and it's it's a really good question because I do think about uh, the follow through with uh, individuals who have been sexually assaulted, which can be women, can be folks who are LGBTQ, sex workers, and whatnot. And what we know is that um, there are so many unprocessed um, rape kits, right? So, yeah. like in the one area where one would say that yes, there is the, the, that you could see a kind of need aligned. Uh, that's helpful to the person who has survived the attack. Um, We're building this kind of healthy relationship with medical personnel may be good in terms of helping to facilitate. (laughs) We see that they go go unprocessed, tens of thousands in the United States uh, today. Um, And I do think that there's so much more to be said about the vulnerability of women in these um, in these intersectional spaces and LGBTQ folks as well that really is just even beginning to be unpacked. Um, Let's see, and that connects to the question of, you know, what does a positive partnership look like? All right, we've got a a question here. Uh, 
from Dr. Bob Turag. Okay, what should doctors and nurses do when patients arrive directly from a crime scene and evidence needs to be collected? In some cases, for the benefit of the victims, how should clinicians know whether to allow police to be present and the extent to which they should cooperate? Bob, we need to do a conference on this. This, this That's the 2022, 2023 goals. So, here, I'm going to go back to the sexual assault. So in the sexual assault arena, because um, so I'm talking about in the 90s, right? So when there was like a, a push that sexual assault was not being treated seriously by police, not by prosecutors. And so then there was a lot of reform that was put in place, right, to help make sure that these things happen. So in the sexual assault arena, you have a ton of protocols about forensic evidence collection. Though this is forensic evidence collection, right? I, I don't know how many emergency doctors and nurses are actually trained to be forensic pathologists or forensic, you know, there is some, I think a lot of uh, training on custody, a chain of custody. But to me, this is about lanes, staying in lanes, because you can be a forensic help medically to the police officer, but can you do that and also be a, a patient care provider without coming into conflict with any certain kind of ethics? What if it's a sexual assault victim who is confiding you but does not want at that time to do anything about it? Then do you say, oh, it doesn't matter. I still think that you still need to be safe, right? Which could be a a human reaction and then say, well, you need to just have the police come in and do the rape kit anyway and get photographed. Like, I don't, I think that that would infringe on the patient's autonomy, right? And like it or not, like whether we make judgments about that or not, that is her choice. And so I think that when I, what I want to see in this question is like, how does the patient feel about it first before we think about whether a police should be allowed to be present and to what extent should we could cooperate? And the police should have their own forensic evidence team if they want to do it or have established protocols with your hospital so people know. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, these questions are so rich, great, great. I mean, it just really shows the importance of doing more work at these intersections. Uh, we have another question that relates to police seeking preferential treatment and whether any of your research um, exposes some of that. Well, there's so I Armando Lara Milan is um, a sociologist at Berkeley, and he's done a, it just came out with a book um, uh, about uh, a hospital in Los Angeles about this precise issue that police were being prioritized in this hospital, um, both because they were both in the trauma bay and also in the waiting room that police in the waiting room would be sometimes deployed to whittle down the, the list um, by kind of just showing their force. So people who on one, you know, one people, one side could characterize as people with not serious -ish issues, two people could be like, uh, the flip side could be a person who does not feel comfortable being in a hospital when there's police roaming around the hallways, uh, but that ended up affecting wait times and the triaging of care. And um, so I would point to that research. Um, I think the extent to which it, um, yes, yeah, so I'll end there, yeah. Okay. Um in the Q and A, also is is um, more of a comment, and it is really worth uh, noting, which is that there are explicit and implicit biases, and that and that's a reality. And mm -hmm. there have been so many studies that document that. Over 20 years ago, the Institute of Medicine study on unequal treatment in the medical space, showing that across hundreds of areas, there's an unequal treatment. And uh, the one area where black people could be guaranteed to get as much or more care than white people was with an amputation. Um, and so, you know, the question that's raised about healthcare workers viewing black people as malingerers or drug seekers is something that um, has been well documented or this concern that black people are just um, seeking stronger medications for pain or on the flip side that black people don't really have pain and therefore when they're asking for pain relief it's actually something that's more nefarious than something that is aligned with treating them and I'm sure you all are aware of that uh, very important um, University of Virginia medical school study of 
uh, medical school students, first year, second year, third year, fourth year, and residents um, that revealed shocking perceptions about uh, how those students um, viewed black patients versus white patients, um, thinking that black patients didn't feel pain as white patients did, that black patients' blood doesn't coagulate as white patients' blood do, that black people have thicker skin density. And this is not a study from the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s. This is a study from just a few years ago. And so these are uh, concerns that remain and that must be addressed and that training really is important. And even I think being able to get at it through sessions such as this, being able to address these issues uh, in ways that are not now let's all sit down and talk about implicit and explicit bias. And those are important, but even to be able to unpack it in this way. All right, our last couple questions. Okay. Um, what about the concern that some are raising um, with regard to the vulnerability of medical professionals vis-a-vis -vis their patients? Um, how is that addressed? And also, is there a racialized lens to that um, at all, do you think? Yeah, and I, I just also see the, the, the note in the chat about the preponderance of negative characterizations in Black patients' charts, like aggression and things like that. And um, one, one way to for, uh, that I've looked at is that yes, so there's a lot, there is a lot in growing research on um, workplace violence in healthcare settings. But the question that I, um, that then comes to mind is that in um, medical providers, uh, people who deal with uh, have, have their own set of ways of confronting those issues, right? So I've been pouring over kind of regulations about medical restraints, right? And that are highly specific. Right. And I'm talking to this one doctor and he's like, yeah, so apparently our risk management says it's OK if I'm standing there and the patient may be acting out a little bit that he can just punch the patient a couple of times. And it's because it is his use of force protocol. And so that's the thing. Right. Medical side of how you might respond to someone who's acting out. Right. And who might require and I'm not this is before I unpack what acting out means um, right. have a different way versus like when you bring a police officer in, it's like when someone told me like, don't go to your surgeon for your back problems because they're just gonna tell you to get surgery, right? If you go to a police officer to deal with the use of force, they're gonna go, uh, what they think is, it's like what we're seeing now with all the calls to reform mental health response, right? The police have a certain way of responding to acute situations and that is with violence. And so is that, something that want, you want to be perpetuate in the healthcare setting, or for example, in San Francisco, they've now invested in its uh, research. Is, I mean, it's question is still out there how effective it is, but behavioral emergency response teams where you have some security, but you also have people who are trained in de-escalation and also trained in de-escalating in the medical sense, right? Or mm -hmm. like the hospital way. So, um, and this is not to discount the kind of security that hospital staff may need to, may um, may need in order to accomplish their job. Yeah, and you know, and, and it strikes me too that these are spaces where, um, you know, I was doing a a, a, a keynote presentation for at, at Johns Hopkins a few years ago, and someone raised a question about um, what about angry black parents in the NICU, this person was saying that they work in the NICU and these angry black parents. <laughs> I think, you know, probably lots of angry parents, It's not just the black parents that are there. We're talking about the NICU, right? So how much of this is the kind of framing of, yeah. I'm, I'm really concerned when this group of people are loud, right? And yeah, in the no, NICU, I mean, like everybody gets loud, right? Like there, there's, you know, right. I mean, it's not like, you know, I, I mean, it, it is that, but we're also sometimes conditioned and triggered by certain communities mm -hmm. and people um, who might act loudly or even aggressively because there's their kid and they're, you know, really worried about whether their child will survive. And it seems to me that those things we, you know, are worth us um, unpacking as, as, as well. Um, yeah, we have another question, which is, what's your recommendation for protecting the rights of other patients in the ED when allowing police in a clinical area to address another matter or accompany another patient? So there's some research that's ongoing about 
design, right? Like or like the the actual physical design of EDs, right? There's um, emerging um, conversations on how to make EDs actually much more private, right? For patients, how do we deal with workflows so we don't have overcrowding? So I think that question is very much tied in with that because it's it's a space issue, right? I've for a while I was doing observational um, visits to EDs before COVID put a shutdown on it, but you know. In, in a lot of these places, it's like just tree flowing. So you can't help, even a well-meaning police officer who's coming in just to talk to that person is going to see patient charts, hear patient information, see all sorts of stuff on their way out. And so I think that this again goes back to hospitals about how is it then, like in one hospital, they said, well, we have a room that police officers have to go to and check in and tell us which patient they're there for, because in other hospitals, they don't even do that, right? Like mm -hmm. they, you don't know why they're there. And the doctors are like, well, I'm not sure why they're here. I think it's this patient, but it might be something else. And so it's like this kind of managing the space because ultimately this kind of, uh, I was on this other, it was one night I was in the ED and then suddenly this like woman came in through the trauma bay. Everybody was like freaked out that she came into the trauma bay without like talking to anybody first. She was there for a gunshot wound. But then at the, I looked around and then suddenly there was like more police officers in this trauma bay than there were medical personnel and nobody seemed to comment on that. And I think there's like kind of like this normalization that happens about police care for some valid reasons and some, some maybe not valid and just accepted mm -hmm. um, that I think can be rectified by thinking about how do we deal with patient flow and how do we deal with like just at the outset without being mm -hmm. aggressive, like without being rude about mm -hmm. it, being like, why are you here? This is our place, right? This is our castle, but can you tell us, and you're here to help, but who are you here for? Well, you know, as we wrap up, and it's been such a robust chat and robust Q&A, and I, I wanna just close with regard to the questions that have been put or the comments in the chat with about the um, growing policing of the reproductive space what this may mean for people who are going to manage um, reproduction at their home, manage uh, abortion at home, which for many people may spare them from harassment at clinics. But at the same time, we know that the constitutional rights that uh, were um, articulated in Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey are very vulnerable right now. We see in Texas the SB 8 law, which provides for a bounty uh, to be placed on people who aid and abet in the termination of a pregnancy. Um, we see other states with copycat laws, no exceptions for cases of rape or incest. We're in a pandemic, and during this time, we've seen the increased use of, of medication for terminating a pregnancy, but there are deep concerns about what that's going to mean if states begin criminalizing in that space, and some already have, and we see that in the chat. And so as we wrap up, you know, I just want to acknowledge those concerns that are in the chat. They serve as part of uh, something that I was seeing more than a decade ago, hence the writing of Policing the Womb. I, it was a book that I thought would take me two years and it took 10 because the more that I researched, the more that I saw, the time I spent in Alabama, the time that I spent in um, Arizona um, leading a task force with Amnesty International, doing work with the ACLU, all of that is the more that I saw, the more across states um, these efforts that bring us till now. And I think what was so disheartening is that so many didn't see it as I was articulating and writing about it, where people really thought this isn't going to happen in the United States. We've got Roe v. Wade. This is no, we're not going to see that day take place in the United States. But on the ground, I was already beginning to see it. And so I want to close off um, with you, Professor Song, and just see, you know, whether any of your work in the future um, may take a look into some of that area, that kind of intersection of policing and reproduction at all. Absolutely. Well, well, your book, Policing the Womb, was really one of the first things I read and kind of gave me even a framework and a lens to articulate the problems that I was seeing. And it's something I routinely come back to because Ferguson versus City of Charleston, which is like an important Supreme Court case, actually the only one that said that this, the way that the medical personnel have cooperated with police here is wrong, right? This is a law enforcement purpose and you shouldn't be doing it. And then you see, and um, nothing else being very protective since, 
But then when I, so part of this, like this mandatory the reporting on each other and reporting of patients, especially because of um, what, when abortion was banned, I was doing a lot of reading of that. But I, you know, when I first started on this project, I could, I read your book and I could also see like we're on the horizon where we might be heading, but I didn't quite know we would be where we are now. And so even just in the last few months, it's really changed the lens in which I'm thinking about it, where this idea, that, uh, so one of the reasons why I focus not just uh, kind of more generally is because um, you know, it's, 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 I'm trying to say it's a general problem, but you, how can I not at this moment think much more about the ramifications, especially as we see criminalization on the horizon that res seems so repetitive of things we saw past and that we thought we were past, but we aren't. And an area that may make uh, medical professionals vulnerable who want yes. to care for um, there are women um, and LGBTQ patients that need reproductive health care services. So there's more, more to come in this in this space. Um, I'd like to close with thinking about a silver lining, right? Is there, um, you know, is there either a silver lining in the space of this or something that you might recommend for medical providers who want to um, be on both the sort of right side of the law and the right side of their patients? and who want to make sure that they are not the sort of cog in the wheel that um, that somehow makes people's civil liberties and civil rights more vulnerable in the space. Because I think that that's part of that gray zone, right? Yeah. If the medical professionals will do it, then it's all good. But yeah. you know, what advice do you give? What silver lining? Well, so I have a silver lining and then I have advice. So the advice is I tell people that there's a couple things. Like one, you can, there's like right now, what's so amazing is that there's like cops out of care. There's all sorts of like organizing going on, but two, you could have, there's, there's ways, I think of it very simply as like, okay, think about um, what about this care that you're providing right now is different than if a law enforcement was not here, right? So establish that boundary, then make the request, make the request of the officer so that you can go back to how you would otherwise treated this patient and then document that and then turn to your patient and explain why you did it. Because I think that there is a powerful statement to your patient to show that you have delineated or recognized the situation. You have done the best you can, and, and perhaps because perhaps the, the officer has not listened to you, but that you respect their autonomy and and their informed consent as well. And their so consent. that if a law enforcement comes in and says, we want you to do this. Yes. No, I mean, there is seeking informed consent from that individual. And that's not something that law enforcement can just no. wave at all, right? That is empowerment, right? For nurse, doctor, I need to get informed consent. If the patient does not consent to this, then I'm not doing it. Right. And I think that's the other thing is to both in your notes, because I know that, you know, um, physicians are so note heavy, but also with your higher ups, your administrator, the how is this law enforcement impacting my ability to give adequate care, right? And so, and I think that this often falls by the wayside. And then I'm gonna end with a silver lining, which is that I think that um, the reason why this gives me hope is that you, we, you could, there could have been an alternate universe, right? Where you could see, if you take the medical profession at its most altruistic, right? As the healers of our world, right? And you had the healers of our world intersecting with people who um, you can conceptualize as being like the avatars of violence in our society, right? Couldn't there have been an alternative um, way in which this could have come out where we could have infused this mass incarceration state with more th thoughts of like dignity and autonomy and saving life right, rather than diminishing life. And I still think that there is that possibility. And so that's like what I'm working for in both my research and in my policy prescriptions and in like these conversations that I have with all of you. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Michelle, this has been a dream. So to just be in conversation with you and all well, on Zoom. It's been my pleasure. And I want to thank our audience for joining us today for the third in our three-part series.
uh, as we are examining uh, contemporary concepts in uh, medical ethics. And we've done so across spaces of the ER room, uh, reproductive health rights and justice and professionalism as well. So I wanna thank you all. I wanna thank Ashley Trotman because these things don't happen without people behind the scenes who help to pull it all together. And I'd like to thank my colleagues at Harvard Medical School and our Center for Medical Ethics, and for you all for tuning in for our program. Uh, we look forward to seeing you when we do this again in our next academic year. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.